So, thanks for giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, some ongoing research into the role of prostate artery embolization within the treatment of uh, BPH. Put the lights down. So, brief overview of what I'm going to discuss this morning. I'm going to look firstly at a case study to give you a bit of a flavour of how BPH fits into the management of BPH. Uh, look at the current management options in terms of uh, medical and surgical treatment options. Uh, look at where I think prostate artery embolization fits into the management scheme. Look at the literature, firstly within the animal experimentation surrounding PAE and then some of the clinical studies. I'll then look at what we're doing here in Oxford with regard to the ROPE registry or the registry of prostate embolization and then the STREAM trial which is an ongoing study looking at this technique. And then finally, I want to conclude by looking at the role of uh, PAE within prostate cancer, which I think is a potential new, exciting avenue. So firstly, case study, and that of a 76-year-old gentleman who presented to the acute surgical take with acute urinary retention, secondary to an enlarged prostate. He had extensive cardiac history with three myocardial infarctions uh, and had residual congestive heart failure and a dilated cardiomyopathy and it had a cardiac defibrillator placed for recurrent VT, so he wasn't the best surgical candidate. Unsurprisingly, he was on multiple cardiac medications and was on an alpha blocker for his BPH. He was admitted under the urologist who placed uh, a urinary bladder catheter and had a successful uh, trial without catheter at two weeks uh, following a decompression of the bladder. Unfortunately, he represented three months later, this time with gross hematuria, uh, of, prost of prostatic origin as assessed at cystoscopy and on CT. And at this time, he was treated with multiple uh, packed red cells and interstitial laser therapy to try and control the bleeding. Interestingly, his prostate was large at 305 mils, and he had no evidence of prostate cancer on prior biopsies. So this worked for a brief period of time, but again, he represented this time three weeks later with gross hematuria and the extent of bleeding was so significant that he was actually hemodynamically unstable at this time. Not the best surgical candidate, as mentioned, due to his severe uh, cardiac comorbidities, he was referred to interventional radiology <coughs> excuse me, for consideration of embolization. This is the angiogram of that case, and you can see that uh, the arterial anatomy is, is awful. He's got marked stenosis of the left common uh, iliac artery, an occlusion of the external iliac here, and again, multifocal stenosis on the right. This uh, picture here on the, on the right is an angiogram within the delayed arterial phase, just showing the contrast enhancement within the lobes of the prostate here. The radiologists were uh, skillful enough to get into the prostate artery despite the marked um, tortuosity and atherosclerosis, and they embolized this prostate artery to stasis. They did so using uh, calibrated PVA particles, which are small plastic beads which lodge into the end arterioles of the prostate and cause uh, distal embolization within the gland. How did the patient do? Well, the hematuria stopped almost immediately, and he was discharged at day five and was followed up by at two, five, and 12 months. And at 12 months, the uh, clinical team found that the size of the prostate had actually reduced to 62% of its initial volume. But interestingly, uh, again, he's found that the, they had a significant improvement in the patient's uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. He had no adverse effects in terms of sexual function. And this actually is the uh, description of the first uh, published case of PAE showing the ut possible utility of it within the treatment of lower urinary tract symptoms. And this was only in 2000 by Demerit et al. So what is BPH? Well, it's... Uh, enlargement of the prostate, and it's normally uh, etiology is that of multiple nodules that uh, undergo trophic enlargement, and it leads to uh, pathologically defined uh, nodal enlargement of the gland, which uh, impinges on the prostatic urethra and uh, leads to a whole raft of symptoms. Its prevalence increases with age, and by the time chaps are in their eighth decade of life, over 80% of men will be affected by uh, the condition. What are the symptoms? Well, it's an extremely morbid condition, and the chaps that I see that get referred to us for prostate artery embolization uh, often say that their life is dictated by where the toilets are. And some chaps uh, uh, struggle to actually 
uh, maintain uh, full-time employment because they're constantly thinking about where the next toilet is and they can't travel around with their work. Um, the common symptoms that they describe are urgency, double micturition, poor stream, frequency, um, getting up multiple times at night to, to go to the toilet, and sexual dysfunction. What are the treatment options? Well, a lot of these patients are managed in the community by the GPs, and the mainstay of treatment is, is pharmacotherapy. And there are two main classes of drugs. Uh, the alpha blockers, which are smooth muscle relaxants that act on the base of the bladder and the prostate to try and increase flow. And the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and these are uh, inhibitors of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which is uh, seminal within the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And it's the DHT, which is trophic to the nodules within the prostate that proliferates the growth of the gland and leads to the symptoms of BPH. These drugs aren't without their uh, problems, and hypotension uh, is, is a fairly common side effect, particularly with the alpha blockers. Uh, patients also complain of reduced libido and erectile dysfunction. So where does uh, surgery fit in? Well, men who remain symptomatic despite maximal medical therapy, or who develop upper urinary tract injury, such as hydronephrosis, or lower urinary tract injury, uh, such as recurrent UTIs, uh, usually require invasive therapy. You'll all have heard of uh, transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP, and this is uh, by and large the most common surgical option for these patients and remains the gold standard. And it works. There's a, a long um, uh, evidence base for this operation with a reported uh, reduction in the International Prostate Symptom Score, which is a, a validated questionnaire looking at symptoms of BPH. And TERP has been proven to reduce these symptoms by up to 70%. TERP's also able to increase maximal urinary flow rates but it's not without its complications. And TERP is uh, associated with complications up in approximately 20% of cases, ranging from uh, recatheterization, perforation of prostatic capsule, hemorrhage requiring transfusion, UTI, uh, urethral stricture requiring dilatation, incontinence, and reduced sexual uh, performance, particularly retrograde ejaculation. What about large glands? We know that um, for patients over the age of 60 who've got large glands, TERP does run into uh, some difficulties. And traditionally, open prostatectomy was reserved for glands of greater than 100, uh, 100 mil. But again, with that operation, carries with it significant morbidity and uh, uh, prolonged hospitalization in, in some cases. There are uh, some new, less invasive techniques that are uh, coming online within urology. Uh, these include the HOLEP laser, which is probably the most widely used um, endoscopic transurethral technique. Um, and this has uh, evidence to show that it is successful in large glands with favorable outcome compared to TURP. And the follow-up data is good in terms of the literature. But again, it does suffer from its complications, and one of the main ones does seem to be sexual dysfunction in the form of retrograde ejaculation. Uh, there are other uh, transurethral techniques, such as the Urolift, in which the urologist literally pins the sidewall of the prostate back to try and increase the aperture through which urine has to flow through the uh, prostatic urethra. And then there are other um, uh, energy-based techniques, such as uh, photoselective vaporization, transurethral needle ablation, which relies on radiofrequency, and microwave therapy, again, another ablative technique. So where does PAE fit? Well, I think given the number of uh, new minimally invasive endoscopic techniques, there's clearly uh, a gap and a need for other um, treatments in addition to TURP. And I think the benefits of PAE are that it truly is minimally invasive and it's not transurethral. So the <coughs> procedure is performed via uh, an arterial puncture and it's done normally just under local anaesthetic. In the minority of cases, we may add in a bit of conscious sedation, but we don't require general anaesthesia or spinal anaesthesia. It's day case, so they come in, they have the procedure, they're looked after in our interventional radiology day case unit, and then they go home. And we don't require bladder catheterization, either pre or post. There's no correlation between complications and gland size, unlike TERP. And in fact, what we've found from our data is the larger the gland, the better you are with PAE. And it stands to reason, the larger the gland, the more vascular the uh, BPH is, and therefore, the better the flow dynamics and the more... Uh, um, extensive your endpoint of embolization. And there's no reported effects within the literature on sexual function. So let's move on now to look at some of the literature. And I think a good place to start is with the animal experimentation. And all of this work really comes from the first publication from Demerit in 2000, where they found this uh, inadvertent link to uh, treatment of the patient's LUTs uh, following embolization. 
So this table just looks at the three most common, uh, sorry, the three largest papers looking at animal experimentation. I'll, I'll, I'll look at these briefly in turn. So the first comes from Sun et al, published in 2008. And what they did is they randomized eight pigs to have prostate embolization and eight controls. Embolized them all with um, PVA particles. And what they found when they looked at the pathological specimens of these animals, uh, bladders, ureters, um, urethra, and colon, is that they had no signs of embolization in them. And that's a good thing. Now, why is it good? Well, if you're aware of the arterial anatomy of the pelvis, it's very complicated. And the prostate artery often shares its origin from the superior vesicle artery or the middle rectal artery. And so you can imagine that inadvertent embolization of these organs can lead to serious problems. So at this very early stage, it was very encouraging that you could achieve prostate embolization without embolization of these other pelvic organs. They also found that there was a statistically significant reduction in prostate volume. Next paper, 2009 this time, they used dogs and they induced prostate hyperplasia by giving them hormones and they followed them up after embolization with MRI at 12 and 24 weeks. They also harvested the prostates and bladders of these animals uh, um, pathologically. So what did they find? Well, they found an 81% mean volume reduction on MR follow-up on the prostates. And, and again, um, encouragingly, they didn't find any features of micro or macroscopic change within the bladder. So none, no non-advertent, uh, non-target embolization. Final paper, again, they used uh, dogs to embolize the prostates. They embolized seven and had three as controls. Again, PVA um, plastic particles were used. And what they found was that in all animals that were embolized, they had evidence of intraprostatic cavitation. So let's just have a look at some of the pathology specimens from these studies. Um, you can see here in slide A, you've got areas of cystic necrosis and fibrosis within the surrounding gland. B, you've got areas of fibrosis, and these included uh, occluded vasculature within the H&E stain. But I think C is the most important. What this shows is that you've got marked diffuse infiltration of inflammatory cells. Now, why is that important? It's important because it enables you to understand exactly what goes on with embolization. Embolization is an inflammatory process. You uh, are putting a foreign material in the form of PVA particles into the end arterioles that goes into the capillary bed, and then there's an inflammatory response. And we know from cellular studies that macrophages come in and try and engulf these uh, particles. And that's important. It's important to realize because actually, unlike TERP or some of the endoscopic techniques, you're not removing tissue at time point zero. You'll get inflammation, and often symptoms get worse for the first month or so. And then there's uh, cystic cavitation, um, apoptosis, and reorganization within the gland before the patient starts to achieve benefit. So that's an important concept to take on board. I think this is also a very interesting slide. This comes from Sun's work in dogs. And these pathological specimens of the prostate can see that they, there's actually no normal prostate tissue left after embolization. All you're left with is the fibrous prostate capsule. What does that look like on MR? Well, this is a, an axial T1 weighted sequence. You can see that there's just signal void there. And that, again, is correlated with the path specimen. You've just got the fibrous capsule, a bit of normal prostate posteriorly, but no central gland uh, to speak of. Final bit of path. This just shows the um, PVA particles lodged within the end arterioles, the breakdown of the normal architecture of the prostate, and fibrous infiltrates. So what about studies in man? Well, the first intentional treatment for BPH for PAE was performed by Carnivale in Sao Paulo in 2008. Following that time, there's been 10 further studies, of which there's two RCTs and nine non-randomized trials, which have looked at the role of PAE uh, in LUTs. And to date, that equates to just over 740 patients who've undergone PAE. And in all 11 studies, the authors have demonstrated a consistent, significant reduction in the international prostate symptom score uh, at a year, with improvement in the scores ranging from 12 to 21 points. They've also proven a significant improvement in quality of life. And this is important because quality of life is, is severely affected by this disease, as I've alluded to earlier. Patients really struggle to maintain their activities of daily living. Um, these studies have also proven improvements in urophilometry, so the urinary flow rates have improved, ranging from 32 to 227%. It's worth just pointing out what the IPSS score is, and those of you that uh, aren't aware with the literature, um, IPSS is a validated questionnaire that basically asks these seven questions pertinent to the symptoms of BPH, and it scores the severity of their response, giving a stratified overall score as mild, moderate, severe disease. 
The IPSS also includes a quality of life assessment where patients are asked to score uh, their quality of life pertaining to their um, symptoms of BPH from zero to six. This table just shows the 11 clinical studies of BPH. I won't going to go through each in turn, but just to highlight that the technical success, which is defined as um, embolization of both prostate arteries, is high, ranging from 75 all the way up to 100%. The largest study in the literature um, comes from Professor Pisco's group in uh, Portugal, published in 2013. So again, uh, very recent evidence. And this is a prospective cohort study, which looked at uh, 255 patients with symptomatic BPH, refractory to drug therapy for at least six months. They uh, performed the procedure as an alternative to TURP, and the patients were told that this was an experimental technique. And in this study, they had a technical success of 82%, defined as embolization of both prostate arteries. What did they find in terms of clinical outcome? Well, the clinical success of this study was defined as an IPSS reduction of at least 25% and quality of life improvement of at least one point. And they found that this was achieved in 81.9% of patients at a month, dropping to 75.2% at a year, and maintained at 72% at two and three years. They had one major complication, and this really does um, um, highlight the importance of knowing your anatomy. They had inadvertent non-target embolization of the bladder, which had to be repaired surgically. And I'll go on to tell you some of the techniques we use in Oxford to try and minimize this happening. Um, they also found that there was a mean uh, Qmax improvement from 9.2 pre-PAE pre to 12.8 at 12-month follow-up. I mentioned that there are two RCTs in the literature, and I think I'm just going to touch on these uh, before we come on to the work we're doing here in Oxford, just to show you this evidence. Um, the first RCT was published in 2014, um, published in Radiology, and what they did is they randomised 57 patients to undergo PAE and 57 patients to undergo TURP. This table just shows their baseline characteristics of the, with which there are no significant differences. And these graphs show the main clinical outcomes from this uh, randomized trial. And just to orientate you, you've got the PAE cohort in blue, the TERP cohort in red, um, just taking each in turn. So this graph up here, top left, is the mean IPSS score. So you can see from both interventions, there's a reduction with time in the IPSS score. But the TERP group do better initially. Um, but at 12 months and two years, you can see that both uh, um, treatment options then meet. So there's, uh, uh, th there's the same outcome. Bottom left, this is the mean peak urinary flow rate. Again, similar trend. Both interventions improve urinary flow rate, but TERP seems to be better initially at three to four months. But then the PAE cohort catches up, and at 12 to 24 months, there's uh, no real difference. Same trend for mean quality of life scores. Both treatment arms uh, get a reduction in quality of life, an improvement in quality of life, rather. Um, but the TERP group um, managed to uh, achieve that quicker, but PAE catches up. And six months, 12 months, 24 months, uh, they're, they're equivalent. Finally, same trend with the mean post-void residual volume. Both treatment groups get a reduction and improvement in this. TERP does better initially. PAE catches up. Why is this so? Well, it may be to do with the fact that there's reorganization of the prostate following the inflammatory change, and it takes time for this reorganization and the patients to achieve uh, the maximum symptom benefit. Uh, the second RCT comes from Carnivale's group, 2016. Smaller study, they randomized 15 patients for TERP, 15 patients for original PAE, and then 15 patients for what they uh, call perfected PAE. And this is an acronym which stands for uh, proximal embolization first and then embolization distally. Now, uh, what they do with this is they go into the prostate artery in the proximal segment, they embolize, they then place the catheter distally, embolize more just to try and uh, optimize their embolization endpoint. Um, in all groups from this study, they experience a significant improvement in their IPSS, quality of life, prostate volume, and Qmax, and they found that the TERP and perfected PAE groups both resulted in statistically significant lower IPSS than the original PAE, but there were no differences uh, from one another. Finally, they concluded that TERP resulted in significantly higher Qmax and smaller prostate volumes than either of the PAE groups at 12 months. So what are we doing in Oxford? Um, about four and a half years ago, we were lucky enough to fly out to Lisbon to meet Professor Pisco and his group. And this is just a picture of myself with uh, my radiolo radiology colleagues, Dr. Tapping Borman and 
uh, Mr. Crew, uh, who was in the audience, and uh, we went up there to uh, meet him, uh, see the procedure, uh, meet some of the patients, and try and understand uh, which type of patients we should be doing this on, how we should do it technically, and how we should follow them up to maximise our results. So we came back to Oxford, and um, we um, enrolled in the UK ROPE registry, and that's, that's the registry of prostate embolisation. Now, the UK ROPE registry is a prospective registry that tries to answer the following questions posed by NICE in 2013. Firstly, is PAE a safe and effective treatment option for lower urinary tract symptoms caused by prostate enlargement? Secondly, how does PAE compare with conventional surgical treatments, namely TERP? And finally, which patients would most benefit from PAE over other treatments? And the primary outcomes of this uh, prospective registry were IPSS change uh, from baseline to 12 months. And the secondary outcome measures were a comparison of IPSS between the PAE and TERP groups. They wanted to assess safety profiling of uh, the embolization procedure. They were very keen to look at sexual dysfunction, as we know from the surgical literature that this uh, can be a problem. So to do that, they looked at the International Index of Erectile Function, which is a validated questionnaire uh, to assess uh, sexual dysfunction. They wanted to compare PAE to TURP, HOLEP laser, and open prostatectomy. They wanted to look at prostate volumes following the procedure, and finally wanted to assess urinary flow rates. So we were one of 19 NHS trusts which were included in this uh, nationwide registry, and the registry closed in the back end of last year, and it managed to recruit 300 patients, of which there were 210 patients who underwent PAE, 77 who underwent TERP, and only 13 who were included who had HOLEP. And the results of this study are uh, due to be published in the summer of this year. We're also uh, running our own prospective uh, cohort feasibility study known as STREAM. And this is a study that aims to recruit 50 patients to undergo PAE. And our primary outcome measure is clinical success as defined by the IPSS scores. But we're also interested to look at the imaging characteristics of this um, technique. And this is an area that not many authors have really concentrated on. So what we're doing is we're performing multi-parametric MRI pre and then post embolization at follow-up. And we're also interested to look at the safety profiling uh, of the embolization procedure. The study has been funded by the Royal College of Radiologists and the uh, Oxfordshire Health Service uh, Research Committee. And the trial opened in, 2000, uh, in December of 2014. And to date, we've recruited uh, 41 patients, so, so we're almost there we're at our, uh, our 50. Uh, the inclusion criteria for this work uh, includes patients who are men or who are older than 60, with a diagnosis of BPH, who have been refractory to medical treatment for at least six months, and are able to lie flat for at least six hours. And this enables us to uh, perform the procedure and then uh, recover them afterwards with regard to their groin puncture. <coughs> We exclude all patients who've got uh, prostate cancer. We exclude patients with advanced atherosclerosis and tortuosity of the iliac arteries because it can make the uh, procedure impossible. Uh, we exclude those with medical history of hypocontractile bladder or other neurogenic bladder disorders. Uh, we want to exclude those with renal impairment, bleeding diathesis, requiring uh, oxygen for ambulation and low life expectancy as a common exclusion criteria within trials of this type. This is, uh, I don't know how well that projects, but this is just a, a flow chart of the STREAM um, trial. Uh, patients are identified uh, in urology clinic by the urologists. They're then assessed in the standard way with clinical history examination, uh, PSE, to exclude uh, prostate cancer. If the patient adheres to the inclusion exclusion criteria of the STREAM trial, they're then referred to us. We then uh, go through what's involved with the embolization procedure and organize them to have a C2 angiogram. Now, the purpose of the CT angiogram is twofold. Firstly, it's to look at the access vessels and the iliacs to exclude those patients that have um, uh, hostile iliac anatomy in terms of atherosclerosis and tortuosity. But secondly, and perhaps most importantly, we use the CT angiogram to plan the procedure. As I've alluded to, the arterial anatomy of the pelvis is extremely complicated, and we want to know exactly where the prostate artery arises from before we go in to do the case so that we know what we're dealing with, so that we actually can draw a map of the uh, anatomy. And it not only speeds up the procedure and limits, lim uh, limits the radiation dose, but it also, I think, reduces the inadvertent non-target embolization by having that a priori knowledge of the anatomy. 
Um, we then arrange multiparametric MR before the procedure, and we get the patient to um, complete a whole raft of questionnaires. And these include the IPSS, the International Index of Erectile Function, Short Form 36, which you'll be aware is a quality of life assessment, and the EQ5D, another quality of life assessment. And then they go on to have uh, urophilometry. Um, they then come for us for embolization, and uh, we see them again at six weeks where they complete the questionnaires again. And then they're followed up at three months, six months, one and two years, where the questionnaires are again repeated, and we also repeat the multiparametric MRI at this stage. So what's the practicalities of actually performing uh, PAE? Well, we perform them as a day case procedure, and all patients are given um, antibiotics, which they continue for a week to minimize infection. We also give them uh, diclofenac PR. Uh, the reason is that patients often get a bit of retropubic pain. Now, this is, if you know anything about fibroid embolization, the pain that these patients uh, um, uh, get is nowhere near as severe as, as fibroid embolization. Um, but they often get a bit of retropubic discomfort that peaks at about uh, two days after the procedure. And we found that a week's supply of PRN diclofenac uh, PR uh, helps with that a great deal. We perform a right common femoral artery puncture. We navigate a rim catheter initially into the contralateral internal iliac artery, from which we navigate our microcatheter into the prostate artery based on the uh, CTA and the fluoroscopy at the time of the procedure. Once we're in the prostate artery, what we'll then do is perform an on-table rotational dy dyna CT scan. This is a 3D CT that enables us to make sure that we're in the right place. So we're looking for contrast enhancement in the um, half of the prostate which we're in, and we don't want any contrast enhancement with any of the surrounding pelvic structures such as the bladder, the rectum, or the penis. Okay? And this again gives us the added confidence to know that we're in the right place and we're not going to get inadvertent uh, non-target embolization. What do we use for embolization? Well, like all of the previous clinical trials, we use PVA particles, and we've uh, used 200 micrometer particles as our calibrated sphere size. We then repeat the procedure on the ipsilateral side. This is just an example of the CTA. It's slightly over window, but uh, this is a MIP just to show you that uh, you've got the uh, coronal MIP to show you've got the internal ILAC here, and then this small vessel that courses towards the prostate is the right prostate artery. What does it look like when we do the case? This is just an example of a, a digital subtraction angiogram. You've got the rim catheter over the aortic bifurcation here in the internal iliac. Ignore this, this is just reflux into the external iliac. You've got the superior gluteal artery here, inferior gluteal here. This vessel that courses round the deep pelvis is the internal pudendal artery. You've then got this vessel that comes down and forks like a lizard's tongue, that's the obturator artery. And you can see this vessel here that comes off of the midpoint of the obturator artery this is the prostate artery. So this is the vessel that we need to get into with our microcatheter. This is us in the prostate artery now, and contrast enhancement shows that there's enhancement of the left side of the prostate here. I mentioned that the anatomy is difficult, and this is a case just highlighting exactly how difficult things can get. So again, we're over the aortic bifurcation in the internal iliac artery with our rim catheter. And just to orientate you once more, you've got the superior gluteal artery here, inferior gluteal artery, you've got the internal pudendal artery here, middle rectal, you've then got the superior vesicle artery here, and then coming off of the proximal portion of the superior vesicle artery is this vessel here. This is the prostate artery. So you can see that we need to make sure that we're a decent way down that prostate artery, because otherwise what we're going to do is we're going to reflux particles back up and potentially into the superior vesicle artery and cause bladder ischemia. So it's really important. And as I mentioned, one of the techniques we employ to try and minimize inadvertent non-target embolization is the on-table uh, Dyna CT or rotational CT. And you can see this is just an axial reformat of one of those CTs. We're on the left side of the patient now. And you can see contrast enhancement within the left lobe of the prostate. No uptake in the rectum would be happy from here to embolize with a degree of, of certainty that we're not going to get ischemia elsewhere. Another patient this time, we're in the right side of the prostate gland, contrast enhancement within the right side of the gland, prominent median lobe with enhancement. We know that if we embolize from here, we're going to infarct that median lobe, and um, this is probably the thing that's been causing the patient their symptoms. No uptake in the bladder. Another patient, again on the right side, this time in the axial plane, Contrast enhancement conforming to the right side of the prostate, no uptake in the bladder wall, no uptake in the rectum, 
we're happy and we can embolize uh, with safety. So I thought it pertinent just to briefly look at some of the early dirty analysis coming from our stream trial to give you a flavor of, of, of what to expect. Um, this data um, is based on 28 of the patients with a mean follow-up of eight months. Um, and following multivariate analysis, you can see that there is a reduction in the IPSS from 22 to 11, which is significant. There's a reduction in prostate volume from 90 to 59. And there's improvement in quality of life, and I think that's important. Also, interestingly, there's no effect on sexual function uh, when you break down the IIE, IIEF um, categories. The technical success from these patients is 96%, and that's defined as uh, successful embolization of both prostate arteries. In one case, we were only able to embolize one side due to um, stenosis of the origin of the prostate artery. And as mentioned, there's a significant improvement in uh, IPSS and volume reduction. And overall, if you look at this data, there's a mean reduction in the prostate size of, of 30%. In terms of complications, we've had one patient who went into urinary retention following the procedure requiring uh, a urinary catheter. And as I mentioned, this is probably due to uh, the inflammatory response that you get immediately post embolization and the worsening of symptoms. And we've had one case of uncomplicated urinary tract infection. Now, I mentioned that the, one of the main secondary outcomes of this trial is to look at the imaging correlates of uh, PAE. And Having looked at the data, one thing that I noticed is that those patients who've got adenomas, large adenomas in the prostate, often do better. So they get a better clinical response as a, as a result of the embolization. Now this is a T2-weighted uh, axial MRI of the prostate. And you can see that there's a big <coughs> adenoma here within the left central gland with a cl uh, classical uh, dark pseudocapsule here. So having gone through the cohort and, and picking up on this trend, I hypothesize that if you've got adenomatous dominant BPH, you're more likely to get a clinical successful outcome. Why? The adenoma is hypervascular. We know that from multiparametric MR uh, uh, um, imaging. And therefore, it stands to reason that if you've got greater vasculature going into your adenomas, you're more likely to get preferential flow dynamics into the adenoma. And therefore, you're more likely to get preferential embolization of these lesions compared to the surrounding gland. So to that end, we've just had a paper accepted um, which looks at this theory, and I defined adenomatous dominant BPH as uh, a gland that has two or more adenomas within the central gland of a centimeter or greater in diameter. And I went through the stream cohort as it exists to date and identified 12 patients from this, this group. And then I uh, ma aged matched them to 12 patients within the cohort without adenomatous dominant BPH, as defined on the pre-procedural uh, multiparametric MRI. This just shows you the uh, characteristics of those two groups, um, of which there's no significant difference. And then this just shows you the main results of this paper. And I think it's interesting, because what you find when you do your multivariate analysis is that you get statistically significant improvement in IPSS in the group with adenomatous dominant BPH. You also get a statistically significant reduction in prostate volume. And interestingly, uh, like with the overall stream cohort, there's no effect on sexual function. I think a picture speaks of a, a thousand words, and this just highlights that theory. So you can see here, this is a, a T2-weighted axial MRI scan with a huge adenoma within the right central gland, causing displacement of the prostatic urethra to the left, causing disruption of the symmetry of the gland. Three month follow up, we've embolized the gland and you can see there's preferential embolization within the adenoma. This is uh, an equivalent slice and you can see now that that adenoma has gone to, to nothing. There's now a hole where that adenoma was. There's now maintenance of the symmetry of the gland and the prostatic urethra now passes without resistance through the center of that gland and the, prostate, uh, and the patient has had a fantastic clinical result at uh, over a year follow up now. Take your mind back to those original uh, experimental studies on dogs. What does that black hole actually uh, correlate to? Well, this shows you. It correlates to cystic cavitation. There's a hole where the adenome used to be, and I think this is uh, a really powerful slide to, to, to um, illustrate that. So I think the early results are encouraging, and there's clearly clinical and radiological uh, improvement 
um, which has been proven in the literature and within our early data from the STREAM trial. There's importantly no effects on sexual dysfunction, unlike some of the surgical and endoscopic techniques. And I think that this role of adenomatous dominant BPH as a radiological marker for predicting clinical success is really interesting. How do I think PAE works? Well, clearly there's a reduction in mass effect. We've shown that from the follow-up MRI. And if you reduce mass effect on your prostatic urethra, you're clearly going to get benefit. That's how TERP works. That's how a lot of these enucleation techniques work. But there's probably also a role within uh, receptors of the prostate. If you initiate apoptosis in the gland, you're going to get a reduced uh, proportion of the androgen receptors. And we know that the androgen receptor is important in the conversion of uh, testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the trophic form that initiates um, hyperplasia. And this is uh, subsequent work, which I'm trying to look at now, looking at the role of the androgen receptor on spectroscopy within MR and biopsy to see if I can prove that this is the case following PAE. Finally, I'd like to just touch on PAE in the oncology patient. So we've embolized patients for hematuria for some time now, and patients with invasive prostate cancer into the bladder often present with hematuria, and this seems to be a successful technique to control that. But I also think that we should think about uh, offering it to patients with disseminated disease who've got concurrent troubling BPH, who are not surgical candidates and may benefit from this to improve their quality of life. The other avenue which I'm uh, starting to look at is I think where we've got a real novel, unique uh, access to the prostate with PAE. Now, we know that prostate cancer is a vascular cancer. We know that from um, uh, multiparametric MR and cellular studies. So why not think about embolizing those cancers? Okay, we're in there. We could bland embolize them to try and reduce uh, the perfusion to the tumor. But there's also this uh, concept of prostate artery chemoembolization. Now, I perform um, chemoembolization in the, in the liver for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, I'm starting to think about designing a trial utilizing doxorubicin labeled uh, embolic for prostate cancer. And this is something that I'd be interested to, to, to discuss. Just to show you an example of a patient that we uh, performed prostate artery embolization on who has prostate cancer, and this was the indication of uh, hematuria. So this is a, a sagittal slice, TT-weighted, large prostate cancer here, which is invading the bladder, coming out posteriorly to almost touch the anterior rectal wall here. And if you thought that the arterial anatomy for benign disease was difficult, the arterial anatomy for prostate cancer is even worse because you can see there's multiple parasitized vessels supplying the gland with uh, collateral supply here to the superior vesicle artery. So it really is tiger territory. In this case, we were able to selectively get into the main feeder to the tumor, and this is the hypervascular prostate cancer here, which correlated to the MR, and we embolized it, this time with just PVA, PVA particles. And you can see that that hypervascular supply is gone. All you're left with is the inflow prostate artery. And interestingly still, is that at the end of embolization, there was uptake within the metastatic nodal chains within that uh, external iliac on the right uh, pelvic sidewall. So in conclusion, the early data on PAE is encouraging. It's safe and can be performed as a day, as a day case procedure. And I think the trials are encouraging, although I accept that the data is still fairly, uh, fairly young. Um, there's no cases of sexual dysfunction within the literature. And my work is hopefully going to continue to look at the role of uh, uh, the androgen receptor and hormonal changes post-PAE. And we eagerly await the full stream data set and the rope paper, which is due to uh, be published this year. I think there probably is enough uh, evidence to uh, roll out uh, another RCT in Oxford, looking at PAE versus TERP, or maybe even thinking about randomizing some more of the other endoscopic techniques, such as HOLEP. Um, and I think that these avenues with regard to utilization of PAE within prostate cancer is exciting. I think that we need to look at it here in Oxford, because other groups are starting to think about it as well. I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, IR colleagues who've helped me with this work, Dr. Tapping, Dr. Borman, and Sarah Jane Holt, who's the lead radiographer at the church, who does a lot of the uh, admin work and organizing patients coming to see us, and also Jeremy Crew, who's been uh, fundamental in getting up and running from uh, a urology perspective. Thank you.